Are we recording? Is this thing on? Yes, it is. Welcome to RevOps 500, where we invite the world's top marketers to answer the tough questions facing growing organizations. Ooh, sounds important. I'm Sajil Qureshi. And I'm Gil Bates. Join us as we dive deep into the world of RevOps. We'll be learning strategies and expertise from first-hand experience. RevOps 500 is sponsored by Computer. They provide technical and development expertise to growth-focused marketing. Let's get started. Hey, everybody. Sajil Kreshi here, and welcome back to another episode of RevOps 500. Today, we've got a really, really special guest. I'm just absolutely jacked up to talk to him. His name is Jeremy Wolf. He is the CEO of of First Domino Marketing. He's a B2B technology brand strategist, global communications leader, thought leader. He's a world-class thinker. Yeah, he's just a really intellectual guy. Jeremy, thanks thanks for coming on. I, I don't know if I can do all of those things, but I can do many of those things. How about that? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, so uh, we're really glad you're here. Uh, why don't we get started right away? So why don't you tell me, what is one RevOps myth that you can think of? Okay. Uh, the myth is RevOps is only for large enterprises. So there you go. I'm not sure if you've heard that before, but... I remember way back in my career, I was, I was working in Hong Kong. I was uh, working for an agency and IBM was a client and they were one of the first companies, at least in the tech sector, that was talking publicly about combining teams for folks on RevOps. And that was a massive, massive learning curve for everyone involved. Uh, but uh, the, yeah, the, the, the rationale for my myth is I've subsequently worked for a lot of smaller companies for whom RevOps is a much more achievable goal. Uh, because they have a greater control over their uh, their processes. They've got greater ability to, to reallocate resources, and it's easier for them to have a shared vision or objective, uh, whereas some of the large organizations, your silos and your technology and your existing habits and practices are much, much harder to break down and then combine. So, yeah, RevOps is not only for large enterprises, it's for companies of all sizes. So now with, with First Domino Marketing, I mean, are you are you doing a lot of, RevOps work and kind of tying in customer success, branding, sales with small enterprises too. How does that work exactly? Yeah, I mean, First Domino is a brand new entity. You're in fact one of the first people to say the name out loud. So thank you for saying that. Uh, yeah, my client base is a combination of uh, very early stage startups. So sometimes pre-funding. Uh, I do work with companies that are four or five years old. They have a obviously viable product and market and they've got recurring revenue. And I also work with larger organizations as well, up to uh, Fortune 500 companies. So it's, it's, I, I see across that whole spectrum. So the way that I work uh, is that I, I've been, I'm old enough and ugly enough and I've been doing this long enough to have seen all of the functions that, that are now combined into what is a best practice RevOps organization uh, and seen them work separately and seen them work well together. And so the way that I operate is, is we need to get a shared vision of the customer journey and we need to understand the touch points on that journey, the content and the channels that inform decision as someone goes from awareness through to purchase and beyond. And uh, to make sure that we're always thinking, I guess, in that using our business lens and using that common understanding of that pathway to drive decision making. And so that's the way that I apply RevOps thinking to, to I guess, every job that I have. Uh, and it does, it does sometimes get me out of my depth. I've got to be honest. I get to a point working with founders where I'm getting asked business questions and I got to go, well, I'm, I'm not a lawyer and accountant. I don't know the answer yeah. to that. Uh, but I can certainly give you an opinion based on what I've seen. But yeah, that, that, that's really how I've been able to take some of the RevOps thinking I've seen in larger organizations and bring them down to the, the smaller companies I work with. Nice. And when you, when you talk about the, the main ingredients in RevOps, what exactly are the the main ingredients. So if you know if, if we're making, you know, cookies and cream ice cream, obviously the main ingredients are vanilla ice cream and Oreo cookies, right? Mm-hmm. So what what is the vanilla ice cream and Oreo cookies of of a, of a of a of a good RevOps oh, okay. setup? Yeah, sure. I mean um data integration and management, uh nice. goals and priorities, which I, I talked about before. Yep. Measuring and optimizing, um three, you know, change management. a ah, big one, change management, because for many companies this is a brand new way of working. Uh, and it's again why startups are great because you can create the way of working. Uh, scalability. So does it actually grow? And then I mean, you start with a small team and create best practices and then grow. 
collaboration and communication, communication being the area that I, I tend to work in, and technology, obviously. I mean, how does technology, yeah. how does the right technology inform and create? And technology can be a, a great thing. It can also be terrible because I remember working with a company where they, um, I used to work with a business intelligence company and mm-hmm. I was their CMO for a while. And their, um, their clients would often have a sales team that loved Salesforce. That was their, their data set, their trust is, they're called the single source of truth with Salesforce. Yeah. Uh, and then you've got a marketing team with its own solution. And it's very hard to have a, re- a functioning real ops unit where some people say, hey, look, this is my data set. And other people are going, hey, look, this is my data set. And they're at odds. So technologies are actually a really, really big one. But yeah, th- those are the things that I think make a good one. But those are also some of the challenges as well. So I guess that's yeah, so- what makes real ops Re-Op- interesting. Yeah, so let, let's talk about some of those challenges. So I mean, like you know, you, you rhymed off, you know, technology. You rhymed off, you know, uh, change management, scalability. A couple other ones. What what is the biggest challenge that you see with Rob? It doesn't matter if it's a small organization, large organization. What's like the biggest? I, I think it's it's. I think of all of those actually. It's probably collaboration yeah. and communication because it's a different and wow. change management. It's a different way of working. I think that the the software and the tools and people will always complain about that stuff if it's not the thing they like. But eventually, if it's a thing we use, then okay, that that's it. That that's our that's again our single source of truth. It, it's much more that collaboration and communication, and it's also realizing any sort of change management is a long term play. Um, I mean, for example, as, as you know, Q four is is the worst quarter to do anything, and Q four is the dash for cash, right? Uh, and and but it's also a, a time to actually remind people of what we stood, said we were going to do in Q one, um, and. I think one of the critical things is, is if you have a change management program, like you're, you're moving from a siloed approach to a, a RevOps approach, is agree on the goals. Make sure you've got all the right players involved from the various departments. You've got advocates working as well. And then it's a, a process of outlining the path and constantly communicating. Here's our progress against the objective and goal. And when the Q4 dash for cash happens, as it inevitably will, put it in the context of the change you're trying to create. Because to be honest, if it's, what you do at Q4 is throw away everything you were trying to achieve. Then, then you're going to be starting again on Q1 with a blank piece of paper. And I, unfortunately, I've been in organizations where that, that seems to be the, the process and practice. And then you don't learn and then you don't grow and then you don't get towards, I guess, this nirvana of RevOps, which um, you know, it has to be built around these teams functioning seamlessly around the, the customer or consumer decision. Got it. And you, know, you talked about kind of messing up q4 you know you're not getting q4 right which starts you off wrong in q1 it sounds like that's kind of like a is that a challenge maybe you're facing right now because we're in q1 right now right i mean is that oh, for my clients, ever or? yeah i mean for my i mean again I, i'm i'm building an agency so so personally uh i i am the i'm the i'm every department yeah uh, exactly yeah. so yeah so personally not less of an issue for my clients um some of them are are kicking off annual plans, and some of those plans, I mean, from again, I focus mainly on the marketing side, but some of those plans are touching on everything from, I mean, I don't know, look at the, the CMO role, brand uh, positioning and development, all the way through to user acquisition and retention. Uh, and the plan, I mean, the one I'm thinking of, I'm a CMO for a voiceover IP telephony company, and our, our plan touches on all of those pieces. And in terms of user acquisition and retention, which is, I guess, the close, close I get to sales, I've got objectives from a marketing point of view. And I guess that's one of the benefits of working with a smaller company because, you know, uh, we need a new sales presentation. That's me. You know, we, we need to, to focus on, I know, it's an aggressive blog program targeting in the middle of the funnel. That's me. Uh, I'm working with the, we've got customer support people and, and pre-sales engagement and those types of things. And I work with them very, very closely. And so it's it's less of a challenge for us. It's more a case, I suppose, being a smaller company of having the time to build up those processes and those systems uh, and, then, and then turn them into our way of working. Because honestly, this is a five-year-old company and they've grown very quickly, um, but they haven't always grown with, with best practice in mind. You know, it's the old build the plane while you're, fly, while you're uh, flying it. And so, yeah, from our, from our point of view, I'm, I've been with this company six months, and this is a year where we're kicking off and starting to bring in some of those more consistent processes. So, no, for, for me, uh, Q1 is uh, certainly setting the, the, the goal for the year from a marketing point of view uh, and then making sure that I'm bringing in all those other elements from other departments to, towards that particular success. But, yeah, again, I, I tend to, you know, I skew, I skew the smaller companies where it's not really a case of we need to 
I don't know, restructure ourselves around a RevOps model. It's more a case of we're kind of already doing that now. Let's make it better. And that's where some of those, those topics I mentioned before come in handy. So, you know, it sounds like, you know, you've got a, a pretty full plate here. I mean, like what, what exactly is keeping you up at night, you know, these days? What are you working on? What is something that, you know, you're trying to overcome? It's, it's the, the constant need to be on podcasts. That's what it is. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, keep me up at night. Uh, you know, it's, 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 build, it's, building, a, no, it's building a new um, company. I mean, I, I've been running a single, uh, as a, um, an, an S-Corp, uh, as a single consultancy. Yeah. And I've had the volume of business has been really good. Certainly uh, this year has been phenomenal. Uh, and I've gotten to a point where I, I just can't keep all the plates spinning. You know, I just, I, I can't do it. Uh, and that's where I start to become concerned because I'm, I'm worried about dropping things or missing deadlines or, or whatever. So I, I built first domino marketing as, as a way of building a, a quasi agency model, or at least being able to work with, with uh, smart people who can take on some of the workload. Uh, and also from a revenue point of view, start to target larger organizations with um, more gotcha. sophisticated services. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's building that. And, and I think everything that's attached to that, I mean, first domino marketing's website is not up yet. Because I'm, I haven't had time to to fix the DNS stuff with Google, uh, and so there are there are a whole bunch of pieces there that are keeping me up at night. Because uh, I I need also to be my last call. It's a Dubai based um, uh, payroll company, and I just kicked off a new engagement with them, and so I need to be on that, that call and so on. So it's really a case of trying to you know what I say is working on the business as opposed to in the business. In the business, and I'm, sure. I'm struggling a little with that right now, but you know that there's an end to that. Um, but yeah, those are the things keeping me up at night. Got it. So, you know, you're, you're starting kind of as a, like a, as a solar printer, as in, 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 in the agency, in the agency world, you're, you're in the middle of that. What would you, what would you tell to somebody else who might be starting that journey now? Knowing what Don't, do it. Don't, Don't do, do it. it. Don't, Don't do, do it. Don't do it. No, <laughs> Stay on the podcast uh, circuit. Don't do it. <laughs> I do it. Uh, what would I, what would I tell them? Um, one thing, to be honest, and I, again, I mentioned how old and ugly I am. Um, I've been doing this quite a while, and I've gotten to a point where I think I kind of know what I need to know. I know enough to be dangerous, and I, I'm building a business around what I know. Um, I, For many years in my career, certainly earlier in my career, you'd Google your way to success. I guess today we chat GPT our way to success. But it's just that uh, you're, you're offering advice and counsel, not really based on real experience. It's, it's kind of based on what you think you should say. Uh, and so I'd say give yourself time to learn. Um, and again, that's one reason, for example, my business today is focused on, um, I do fractional CMO work. I do brand consultancy. Uh, so I'm helping companies build brands or rebrand. And I do uh, strategic content. So that's typically websites, blog posts, uh, 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 company um company profiles and that sort of thing. And so, yeah, I mean, those are the things that I like doing and those are things that I've built credibility in. So I'm not going to say this is my agency and we do everything you can possibly do under the sun because yeah, I can't. Full service. I can't be yeah. credible doing that. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not. And I'm talking about being a full stack marketer. I don't know what that is. Um, yeah. I don't know how one individual could possibly do that. Uh, so I would much rather work with smart people. And so I've got partners who can help fulfill the consulting gaps that I have. But yeah, I've been around long enough to know. So I, I'd say focus on those things that you genuinely are good at. Focus on those things that that you can and offer some type of differentiation. Uh, and that that's a challenge. Again, in the world of ChatGPT, that's a real challenge yeah. um, because increasingly the machine is is giving you catching some up pretty damn good answers. Uh, but yeah, focus on differentiation and know your value proposition. And that's how I often start my consultancy is is working out a value proposition. So what are we trying to reach? What are their needs and wants? What is the nature of our service offering and how is it different? Because if you can't answer those questions, then there's no point in building a website or you know, writing a book or whatever your objective is, because you need to figure out the answers to those questions. So yeah, I would say, look at your own business through that lens. Who are you selling to? What do they need and what do they want? What is your proposition and how is it differentiated? And if you can't answer those questions confidently, you probably shouldn't be starting a business. You should be no. looking for someone else. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. That's, that's really good uh, really good advice to anybody who's wanting to start an agency or get involved in that world, for sure. So, so what, what's, what's exciting you about, you know, First Domino and, and the future of RevOps and those sorts of things? What, what, what's, what excites you about that stuff? Uh, what excites me is I've always liked building things. It's kind of in my nature. I've built... Um, when I was in agency land, I built um, new agencies and new offices and new places. 
Um, I built practices, built methodology practice, digital social media, built a global practice. Um, I, I'm always I'm always interested and excited when I'm building. When I'm not building, I tend to get bored, um, ah. which is which is something where I need I need other people to work around me to perhaps manage some of the 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 day to day and long term because I want to go and look over there and find something new to play with. Um, so that, that's that's what excites me is building something new. In terms of RevOps, um, it's it's building that model to a point where it's not a question or it's not we need to build a RevOps practice or we need to pivot to this RevOps thing. It's it's just this is the way we do business, and that's that's one of the good things about working with founders and smaller organizations because, like I said, that's what they're doing innately. And often, unfortunately, the bottleneck for all that is the CEO, you know, because you're 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 also picking up the client calls and making the coffee Absolutely. and everything else. But as those companies that I work with start to grow, it's going okay. Well, the the worst thing we can do is start to build silos. The worst thing we can do is say, hey, we need to look act like a big company. So let's get a VP of sales who doesn't actually do anything tactically, but just talks. You don't need that. You need that later on, perhaps, at a push. But in your early stage, no. You need to people who are going to be hands-on. And I think that's, that's where you're creating a, a, a real RevOps unit, is when people have a functional and practical understanding of what their, what their peers are doing and what their roles are. It's not to say they're interchangeable, but... You've got to be able to work together and speak that same language, especially when you've got things like a, a dominant salesperson, because the danger is that sales voice becomes the only voice in the room. And because it's attached to revenue, it becomes the yeah the, the marketing voice, which is the one I normally have, might sort of be pushed to one side. And, and the fact is they have to work together. The worst thing you can end up with is, I know, shadow marketing. You know, the sales, yeah. I, I had a case with one of my clients where the sales team went up and did their own marketing. And it's just like, what are you doing? I mean... This is what if there is an issue with the, the work, let's have a conversation, but don't suddenly yeah. buy your own people and go exactly. off on a tangent. I mean, we spent three years trying to build a brand here. So yeah, exactly. so yeah, there are some some real challenges, especially as companies grow. But again, I think there's also a generation of new founders and new CEOs who understand this. And I think are probably going to be better equipped than the previous generation in in again creating this kind of I don't know, Venn diagram of of working. That is is ultimately the right way of working. So I, th I think we're getting to a point. I'm hoping where um, this conversation will be one where it's just like, okay, it's more how how is how is the RevOps function going as opposed to yeah. how do we build one or what are the steps to creating one over the next two years? Got it. Yeah, and that's that's the future uh, of of this stuff. Now take me. Let's go back into the past a little bit. You know when when Jeremy Wolf was little Jeremy Wolf. You know when he was a young pup. Uh, when, well, what, what was, uh, I mean, what, what, what's your, what's your background like? I mean, how, how did you get to be where you are now? I mean, you know, how, how, how did you get here? Uh, I think good genetics. Um, <laughs> exactly. Survival. Uh, you know, I don't, I, yeah. It's, it's a funny one. I, I, you can tell by my accent, I'm not from Austin, Texas. Uh, I grew up in New Zealand, long way away yeah. from everywhere else. Uh, I grew up with a passion for words and language and gotcha. I went to college at a time when they paid you to go. And so uh, it was, um, I went because everyone else was going. So I got a degree in English literature, which um, not, not the best professional decision, but you know, I was kind of interested in language and exploring the origins of language uh, and, and through literature. But uh, I ended up doing that and then thought, okay, what do I do? So like most New Zealanders, you travel. So I traveled for a year in, in Europe and North America. Uh, came back home and, and still didn't know what to do. Uh, but I got into I got into an advertising course, and it was run by the big agencies. And at that time, this is in the um, late ninety, uh, no, late eight, eighties. Brief. I'm so old. Anyway, it was a long time ago. Um, it was an advertising course run by the big shops, so Saatchi and Saatchi and, and Chai yeah. and those sorts of things. And um, I, I, the winner of that course got a job. I came second, didn't get a job, but got into advertising myself through radio. Uh, I became a radio copywriter, and I loved that. It was fun. I mean, you got to make up stories in 15 and 30 seconds and sound oh, effects man. and stuff. Yeah. yeah. The money was terrible. Um, <laughs> you got free movie tickets, so that was good. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was, that was where I started, and then I got into PR, and I didn't know what PR was, um, but I got into PR as a long-form copywriter. And so I was writing brochures and you know, things, that, things would, would come with your credit card statement saying you know, how much fun it was to spend money. And, I mean, well, all that sort of stuff. But I was taught to write by two folks who are ex-Reuters journalists. And that that is the thing that I think has been the through line through my career. It's been it's this commitment to language and writing. 
Um, I then went to Australia, got into technology PR. Uh, I was with a company for 18 years. Uh, I ended up running IBM's business across Asia. So I was flying up and down through Japan South. And that was uh, had a very young family. So we decided to move to Hong Kong. And I worked out of Hong Kong for seven years and wow. then took on a digital mantle because the, this is when PR agencies were deciding they needed to become uh, more full service agencies. And so I built a digital practice, moved to the New York office and worked out of there for um, oh, I think seven, eight years as well. And so that was, uh, again, running a North American digital practice. Subsequently, um, that agency uh, is no longer with us, um, joined two other agencies briefly. You know, I got to say, I guess you get to a point in your career where it's hard to start again. And uh, the, the two agency stints I had went, went the best experiences. COVID happens. I remember the day Tom Hanks got COVID. Um, I was interviewing for a job and I thought there's no way I'm getting this job because I know what agencies do when times are tough and they stop hiring senior people and junior people and they push all the weeks in the middle. So I had to I had to double down on my agency. And so I built, I don't know, I double, built a website. As you do, and then from there, it was uh, start to win business, and it was it was eventually start to figure out what makes my business different, and that was the branding word. And so, yeah, so my my story is one of I, I think I've earned the role that I have now over the Absolutely. past like 25, 30 years. Um, yeah, I and, agree with you. And as I go to this next phase, it's more I guess how do I take what I've learned, and this is the kind of terrifying but hopefully gratifying thing. How do I take what I've learned and the processes and things that I do now? How on earth do I teach someone else to do that? And that that's something that I, I'll need to do, but also is kind of a kind of a terrifying thing to think through. But yeah, that that's just, that's what gets me here in front of a, a screen in Austin, Texas on a um, on a windy Tuesday morning. But yeah, yeah I mean, you go. You know, I, I'm I'm now in so much happier my quality of life and everything else. So this is this is a good place to be. I mean, that's a, it's like an amazing story i mean like you know it really is i mean you must have had a lot of uh hopefully you had some good mentors along the way i mean uh can you think of one or anything like that i mean especially when maybe in the marketing rev ops world that kind of helped you along or yeah yeah there was uh there's one guy who he was my boss in sydney and uh he may be listening um does he have a name you should have a name or yeah his name is andrew andrew mcgregor andrew uh, mcgregor so hey andrew um he he was a tough boss uh, he was my first boss when I moved to Australia from New Zealand. And he taught me an awful lot about uh, not just not just PR as it was, the discipline, uh, but also operationally, because he was a very good operations guy. And I think that that's where he, it was perhaps one of his strengths more so than his PR skill set. And he was someone who, and I didn't know at the time, but he was actually kind of guiding me down a pathway. Um, but yeah, he was someone who, who he'd have a spreadsheet in front of him at all times. And he was very, very good at trying to put the work we did in context, not just for the business we're operating in, but also thinking about our clients' businesses too. And I think that that was really important because otherwise early in your career, like I said, you Google your way to success. And back then, it's probably Alta Vista or something, not Google. Yeah. Yeah. Escape we, um, Alta Vista. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And for the young people listening and watching, you just Google what Alta Vista is. There you go. Yeah. But so... Uh, <laughs> I mean, he was, he was great. He was a, he was a tough bastard, um, but he was great. You know, he was able to, he, he, he shaped a lot about my career. Uh, and he gave, um, he gave, yeah, very solid operational advice. And that's important because otherwise, as I say, you're making stuff up, you know, you're going, oh, I, I, and, you, and like a lot of young professionals, you try to consult too early. You feel you have to say something in the room. And oftentimes what you say is just nonsense. It's just cliched and, and silly. So yeah, I, I found uh, working with Andrew uh, helped me understand how businesses operate and, and how marketing operates within businesses and the impact, I guess, as, as a consultant in his business, uh, the impact what I do has on ultimately the things he's measured on, which are things like the bottom line. So yeah, he was very, very good at that. And that, that helped immensely. And again, it, it's rare because awesome. oftentimes people in marketing world, often you run a mile from that side. You know, you don't want to yeah. No, that's 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 the the grown up stuff. We want to go off and be creative. And the fact is, unless you put your creativity in context, it's it's kind of vapor. Uh, so yeah, he's certainly someone that I they often think about as as a, as a mentor and someone who guided the early stages of my career for sure. Such an awesome story. I mean, like, wow. I mean, so like you gotta yell at me, no, though. I mean, you know, look, what is a what is a 
a guy from New Zealand who spent seven years in Hong Kong, then in New York. Now he's in Austin. I mean, what do you what do you guys do for fun? I mean, like, what do, what do you do when you're not running, you know, first domino and being your own consulting practice? I'm like, you know, this is like you got an interesting story here. I mean, are yeah, you yeah. cricket guy? You know, are you are you footy fan? Are you a cricket fan? Are you a football fan? I mean, what what you could go any, you could go any direction? Basketball from New York. I mean, what do you what do you do? No, no, it's rugby, 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 oh, rugby. Rugby, rugby, rugby's your thing. The uh, the 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 true father of American football. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's it's rugby. That that's been something I'm passionate about since I was very young. And it's nice. really as you leave New Zealand, you become more passionate about. I'm wearing actually, I don't know if you can see it. This is my All Blacks jersey here. Yeah, um, All Blacks sweatshirt, uh, which is the the national rugby team of New Zealand. And yeah, so that that's been something that continues to be a hobby uh, and a passion of mine uh, or obsession. Uh, I also am a, a touch rugby referee, so I referee a school, ah. a version of rugby, and I'm involved with the Austin team and also the USA Nationals uh, group as well. Oh wow! So there's those that keep me busy. Um, I mean, I'm a, I'm an avid movie watcher. I, I especially like science fiction movies and um, fantasy, and well, I'll, I'll watch anything. And we live in an era of, of fantastic television too, uh, so I'm, I'm obsessing. I'm a gamer uh, too. I've been gaming since I don't know the. Gosh, early 80s. Um, and so I, I'm playing uh, Metro Exodus right now on PlayStation 5. Metro I was Exodus. playing God of War. So those are the kind of things. Uh, and exploring. I mean, I'm relatively new to Texas and Austin. So it's just it's also getting around and seeing uh, this huge state. Uh, yeah. And I'm sort of doing that too. So, yeah, we, I was down in San Antonio the other day. Uh, and, yeah, just, just making sure we get out and drive. Not now, though. There's ice on the roads, apparently, which means Texas is, is shut down. <laughs> Um, but yeah, those are the types of things. Uh, yeah. And I just, like I said, it's, it's being out of agency life and working for myself gives me the ability to explore those hobbies and passions. And I've got a little more control over my, my day. Um, but the fact is I also, I love doing what I do. And so, yeah, I'll call at 7 15 AM with Dubai to talk about a new app. That's that's kind of yes. I have to get up early and haven't had my coffee or anything. But there's something kind of exciting about that. Yeah, and I suppose it goes back to the point I made about building something. You know, I don't know. I don't know what that project's going to look like. I don't. I don't wheel out a template and go. I'll just type it in here. No, this is this is a, a true piece of consultancy and creativity, and that that's what I look forward to. But yeah, the the challenge obviously is is finding enough time uh, to get it all done. But yeah, that, that's that's when I'm yeah when I'm not sitting in front of screens. I tend to weirdly sit in front of screens. Go figure. Uh, so yeah, what is your what is your favorite? Uh, I mean, you said you're a gamer from the '80s, right? What's your favorite NES game that you can think of? You know, that's oh, what I grew up. I was with. I was a thing called the Commodore 64. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was a Commodore 64. I never went down the Super Nintendo and those things. Oh, you know, one of the console gaming always on the computers. Yeah, I guess back then, I had an, well, I had an Atari VCS. And yeah, it, okay. Kids, yeah. kids, Google that one. Uh, with a like panel that. in the front and the cartridge. Yeah. And yeah. Actually, uh, so I had that, and that was that was kind of it was a tank game and Pong and those things. Yeah, um, yeah Frogger. Gosh, I haven't thought about that for ages. I, I um I had thing I think called a ZX eighty one, which was uh -huh. a by it was a Sinclair, a British made computer, and it had a, a RAM pack on the back. Yeah, sixteen k of RAM. But if you pump <laughs> the RAM pack, the thing would reset. Um, where you were saving games onto or anything onto tape, uh, cassette tapes. Kids Google that too. I mean, it was it was crazy what we went through there. But yeah, I mean, my Commodore sixty four games. I know I used to like Star Wars games and those sorts of things. And then I had a Commodore Amiga after that, which was a very good gaming system as well. Uh -huh. Boy, but no, again, I can't remember. I mean, Super Mario. I remember, I had a Super Mario yeah. phone on sure. my Amiga. Sure. Uh, I used to obsess over that. But yeah, it's it's funny. I mean, it, it's just I got to say the generations today would not put up with the stuff that we had to put up. With no, back. no, they would not. I remember it's getting hard. computer. Here's, here's a small story for you. I, I remember getting Computer World magazine, oh. which was this thick. It used to get yeah. shipped to me in New Zealand, and in the the middle section of the magazine were pages and pages of machine code, oh. and I'd just sit there typing in for hours machine code, and then having to save that onto a cassette tape. Um, and then you start to play the game or run it, and it would take like twenty minutes to load. And then again, it was they, they, this, this is what this is what makes us the great generation. I tell you, yes, you passwords to get the load states of games back, like the passwords to log in, like the the key, oh, the key passwords, yeah. installation discs, boot discs. Yeah. I don't know oh yeah, and a, a game that came on five discs. Yeah. Yeah. yeah this, this is this, 
Kids, welcome to Old Men Talking About Computers. This is the, this is the podcast <laughs> yeah. you signed up for. RevOps 500. Like and we subscribe. Talk about retro tech. Yeah. Like and subscribe. Retro tech hour. Yeah, there you go. There you go. This has been fun. I mean, you know, Jeremy, and I, I've had a lot of just fun talking to you. I mean, like, where, where, can, uh, where can people get a hold of you? I mean, where can we, where can we the, learn more the about best, you? The best place is me on LinkedIn uh, because the, the first domino, I, I guess I'm, I'm building that at the moment. Um, but yeah, me on LinkedIn, Jeremy Wolf, two O's, one L, one F. Uh, yeah, um, find me there. I'm happy to talk to anybody anytime about this stuff. I just, like I said, I, I got into a point in my career and life where um, I become rather pragmatic. And so, yeah, people want advice or something. Just, don't, just for goodness sake, don't try to sell me something because I, I, I see through that in a second and I hate that. But no, if you want to talk about this stuff, I'll, I'll talk until the cows come home, as they say. Um, but yeah, this is, this is the, this is, me writ large and as i say i've gotten to a point in my life and my career where those two things have become wonderfully blurred you know i i i enjoy getting up in the morning and try to solve these sorts of problems and i i, I wish that upon everybody quite frankly um so yeah there we go yeah. it's, it's me and me in a nutshell there you go nicely i mean look it's been uh it's been awesome you know just to kind of jam like this and you know catch up and you know, I just really, really appreciate you coming on, Jeremy. Thanks for uh, thanks for being here. Anytime, anytime, Sajil. Great talking to you. Yeah, and uh, well, you know, guys, thanks for uh, listening. It's another episode of uh, RevOps Five Hundred with me, with me, Sajil Kreshi and Jeremy Wolf. Thanks again, Jeremy. Bye. See you next time. And that wraps up another episode of RevOps Five Hundred. Thanks for joining. For show notes and other episodes, visit us at RevOps Five Hundred dot com. RevOps Five Hundred is sponsored by Copyfair providing technical and development expertise to growth-focused marketing.